This year's Sydney Open delivers a reimagined program of unique outdoor moments and rich online experiences, including today's live panel talk, Connecting with Country, as part of our ongoing First Nations speaker series. My name is Samantha Sneddon, and I'm a proud Wiradjuri and Dungadi woman, and I'm Associate Producer for Indigenous Programs here at Sydney Living Museums. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are presenting from today, the Gadigal people of the Yoro Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which you are all watching and listening from. I'm excited you've joined us today for Sydney Open 2021 and warmly welcome you to today's exciting panel discussion titled Connecting with Country. This session is part of the museum's First Nations speaker series, a powerful new program presented in collaboration with GML Heritage and the Research Centre for Deep History at the Australian National University. The upcoming conversation reflecting on the Connecting with Country draft framework has strong relevance to the work Sydney Living Museums is doing with developing and delivering our First Nations strategy. They both seek to increase understanding of the incredible depths of, the, of knowledge that Indigenous people have continued to have for over 60,000 years and to this day. Please enjoy today's discussion and I'm now delighted to introduce today's moderator, Peter White, Senior Manager of Aboriginal Strategy and Engagement at Create New South Wales. Thanks, Sammy, and uh, Yama, everyone. Uh, as Sammy said, I'm Peter White. I'm a Gumaroi Murray from up northwest New South Wales, uh, Tamworth and Manila country. And what better way to spend a Saturday uh, afternoon uh, with three great friends and uh, having some important uh, conversations here that are uh, much the same as blackfellas all around. We're always here to share and hopefully uh, you know, educate you in uh, some important uh, work that's happening around. Uh, but you know, funnily enough, that just goes back to you know, tens of thousands of years. Um, but uh, other areas of government and that are finally um, getting into the mix of that. So this is uh, actually part of uh, Sydney Living Museum's Sydney Open 2021 uh, Connecting with Country Talk. It's part of the uh, Sydney Living Museum's First Nations Speaker Series presented in collaboration with GML Heritage and the Research, Research Centre the deep history at the Australian uh, National University. And it's great having a speaker series of First Nations when, um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, more and more there's an increased consciousness of the need to understand and, and bring in and this thing of, you know, it's great to actually give Aboriginal people a voice, but funnily enough, Aboriginal people have always had a voice. It's just that a lot of people haven't actually been listening or, or wanted to listen. Mm -hmm. So it's great that Sydney Living Museums have uh, you know, developed this, this speaker series with their partners and invited us in. Um, and we're really excited uh, to share. Now, before we get into some of the housekeeping, I'll undertake the important business. I'd also like to acknowledge the country that we're here on. Gadigal country, but also I have the privilege of living on Gadigal country. But I'd also like to put a call out to my Gamilaroi country up home, which even with uh, this lockdown that we're finally coming out, I haven't had the opportunity to get back home on country and centre myself. And, and mm. I think that's the importance. But I'd also like to throw over and introduce uh, our speakers today, our panellists. Now, I'm sure you've all read the bios. I'm not one to actually sit here and do a formatted thing. So I might just throw open to our three panellists here and get you to quickly introduce us yourselves, but also talk about your country and the importance of country to you, both living and working, if you're off country, if you, and, and what it means. So I might throw open to Alison on the screen. Oh, thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> Um, and I too would like to acknowledge that Gadigal country there. 
Um, I'm calling in from Coffs Harbour, Gumbangiri country here, which is very beautiful. Uh, but I miss I miss Sydney because that's actually where I'm from. I'm well, Bunja and Wadi Wadi is my um, grandmother and grandfather's connection. And my but my, all my family live at Lapa, so I'm I always describe myself as a concrete curry. So when you know, it's interesting thinking about country because it's it is. Uh, it's interesting, you know, being an Aboriginal woman from who, whose traditional lands is is a thriving metropolis because when you think about trying to connect to country, you've got to really dig below quite a few layers of built form to actually get to the soil and to connect to nature. Um, so thinking about the connection to country, you know, from, from being an urban Aboriginal from that point of view, um, I suppose that's what shaped my career. I, I started out in um, uh, working for the government architect 22 years ago with Kevin O'Brien and Dylan Combermary. And so there, there are a lot of those conversations that we were having, but um, I really look forward to the discussion today because it seems this conversation's been going on for a long time and it's really starting to ramp up now. Great. Might throw it over to you, Denia. Yeah, hi, um, Warami. I'm Danielle Hrimek and I'm a Budawang Yuan woman, so that's South Coast. Alison and I are, are cousins, I'm pretty sure we worked that out, didn't we, last time we chatted? Um, and uh, I, was, I, I was born here on Gadigal lands, um, but my family took me up to Bundjalung country, and that's um, in a big way where I grew up, but also around the Newcastle Wobbuckle area. I was lucky to get back on country just before we went into lockdown. So I just felt that like refreshing thing that you feel when you go on country and you, you breathe that air and you touch the ground and you see the heritage and you walk the mountains and you put your feet in the water. And it, 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 get, it got me through lockdown, I have to be honest. And I'm, I was, there's some, it's like the ancestors were like, no, you have to go now and go and be on country. And then they got me through. <laughs> because it was a tough lockdown. I don't know about you guys, but it was tough. And so country for me is where I, where I do go to charge up, like in a, yeah, in a recharge, okay. <laughs> well, <look out. laughs> charge myself up. <laughs> um, not in that way, you guys, come on. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really special visit to go up and um, climb. I haven't climbed that mountain before, the Balgan we call it. It's, called, um, it's also known as Ditzel or Pigeon House. And um, look out over those views and just feel that strength that comes from country and the beauty and the, and the um, I don't know, the energy, which is what I meant by charge. <laughs> So um, that's what it that's what it is. But I, you know, I live here in Gadigal lands, and I was born here, and I feel really connected here. And I f I've worked really hard to feel that connection because I I've had to, um, as somebody who's chosen to live here and chosen to be here and work here, and um, find how to be connected here and how to um, still get the benefits of country um, in an urban environment and find how to do that and work hard at it because it isn't as easy as when you just go go to the bush I have to I'll be honest but it is there like I, I in my PhD I spoke with elders about you know is country there in the city I just wanted to provoke them and they kind of bit my head off which is good um because and they said yeah but what are you talking about of course it is you just got to reach out to your ancestors they're still there and they're still waiting for you to connect with them and so it gave me this sort of real push to um to be um connected here Right. And Adam, aka Black Douglas, Mr. Black, Dr. Black. <laughs> well, what am I to you as well? And, and Guinea Gay up there. Um, it's nice to be here. And I guess, um, like Alison, I was also really raised, uh, uh, well, officially my blood is Guri, but I was raised a Guri. And that was uh, born in Blackstown, um, Western Sydney. And that's uh, Doongagal country and raised in Wienmata country and adopted by the Darug from Boroborongo country. So um, uh, it's it also, yes, very much urbanized, but um, my blood is from um, Dangadi country, Southwest Rocks, which I call Caravan Park Dreaming. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, but certainly been on, um, on Bunny's dreaming, dreaming country down here for the last 
15 years, 17 years actually, in Redfern. And so what I generally try and do, like you were saying, is um, it's the closest, Gadigal dreaming is whale dreaming. So um, the closest thing you can connect to, to Gadigal country is by getting your shoes off and standing in, uh, at any of the beaches on the eastern seaboard. And so when you think about, I've been thinking about when you presented the topics here, um, let's face it, that you've got to go to a, uh, a special place that's as uninhibited as possible in my eyes, barefoot, and uh, that's pretty hard to do in the urban environment. But the easiest place to connect to an uninhibited dreaming is, um, is at the beach here because the sand's constantly turning, the waves are constantly moving, and, um, and that's where you'll, you'll um, recharge in a cultural way um, your energy. Other than that, wherever possible, I get my shoes off and walk barefoot on whatever sandstone platform. And particularly when I was raised in, in out west in Penrith and, and uh, Richmond area, um, it was finding the um, accessible rock art that was executed by the Darug in how, however many years ago, and just sit myself cross-legged on that rock art platform. And, um, and I, I feel that I absorb my, my uh, artistic aesthetic from the local peoples. Great. Well, thanks for sharing all of those little insights and stories. And um, yeah, as I said, it's great being here. We're, we're actually coming live from the gold melting room uh, of the historic mint on uh, Macquarie Street here in downtown Sydney. Uh, I actually had the, the, the pleasure of actually uh, working for a bit of time at Sydney Living Museums. But it's also a bit of a weird thing being in these these spaces, even though this looks lovely and it's a you know a refurbished uh, you know part of the old mint. Um, but that importance, and I think we've just touched on everyone shared a bit about that importance of connecting with country and and uh, you know both from our own country and if we live off country and and the country and these buildings and particularly Macquarie Street and something like, you know, the gold melting route, and there is no gold. I've actually had a bit of a look. So I think they've, they've, you know, tucked that away somewhere. But particularly Macquarie Street, you know, when you walk along a, a modern day city, uh, you know, like Sydney and all these skyscrapers and new developments and, and that, but we also hear this importance that we get welcome to country. We hear the importance of acknowledging country and. Gadigal people and that. And when we're, you know, this is sort of ground zero as well. Um, and these old colonial places. And I also like to look at, you know, Macquarie Street and, and uh, Bridge Street as the sandstone escarpment. You know, it's just been rejigged a bit. But that essence of country is there in that, in that, in that you know, but what does connecting with country mean to you guys? in a big modern city here, and you've all worked extensively and done things in the city um, to try to bring that cultural element out. Any of you? So I'll, I'll, I'll throw it open to anyone. Well, it's more than just, um, country's more than just the ground, of course. It's, it's the water and the air, but it's also all of the knowledge and the stories, and it's the library that holds all of those in place in perpetuity um, for us to, to, to access. It's flora and fauna, it's everything. And, and we're part of country as, as human beings and so it's about connecting to all of those tangible, but importantly in these spaces, the intangible aspects, because we might not see it so much. And sometimes you have to go digging, like you said, you see, you go, oh, there's the sandstone from here. But you know, as, an, as, as designers, we also know that there's more than just the sandstone, there's the lime, which yeah. is part of the culture here uh, with the, from, that came from the middens. And that's um, now appropriated into the, into the lime of the, those old buildings. And, the, and to me, there's a big sad, of course, about that those middens aren't there anymore, but they're also there, they're still there. They're just in a different way, and they're now um, in memory in a different way. And I and I think um, I can't take away the sad, but I also have to celebrate that it's still there, and we're still here, being part of this space. But um, connecting with country is, um, to me, it's a relationship. So it's like every relationship. I have to work on it, 
and work work hard to be part of that and work hard to find that energetic um, interaction that uh, that feels like it's I'm part of that fire that's bigger story that you know whatever it is that's not just um, not just a square building but something more yeah. and it's uh, it's not as easy in the city but you can do it and if you if you seek if you seek it and you're active and you're not just being passive you seek it um, you can find it here mm. I mean I have to do it every day in my work and I do it every day in my life because I live here and yeah. it's it's actually a choice I yeah. think like a relationship and Alison, I was just thinking, you know, the work you did down at the cutaway at Barangaroo with Wellamar, what were the, yeah, were there any challenges there of, of, of that, of conveying that message or, because it seemed to me it was the first time, you know, black fellas really led anything. Uh, yeah. Fully, fully in terms of that, that notion of not stereotyped of a memorialisation that we're, we, we only exist in the past. Well, yeah, I think there's that. I mean, I it's funny, you know, being being from La Perouse, I'm actually obsessed with the past because, you know, it's like we're only left with 10 pieces of a 100-piece puzzle and so, like, I'm trying to find those 90 missing pieces all the time and I feel like my work is always trying to explore that but how that kind of connects so it's about that dialogue between how 65,000 years ago is always present today. So it was really, it's, it's a win with the welcome to country, you know, it's, um, it is what, like what Danielle says, country is like a person, you know, to us, it is a relationship. And so if you don't maintain that relationship, it's like not maintaining a relationship with a family member, you know, you just, it's you, you, your ties are sort of broken, so you need to actually work at any good relationship, and so that's really a two way street. It's not like what can I take from country; it's what can I give back to country. So at the moment, most black fellas are really um, trying to uh, trying to make the broader community aware of country as a broader um, entity like as as sky as land um you know as as sea country water country but also the people in it as well like just as this like you know relationship because country's sick you know so country's actually a very sick family member that we are freaking out about basically and that we're all kind of collectively trying to say, hey, everyone, we've all got to do our part here. But see, those buildings that you're in there and all of those buildings that you talk about on Macquarie Street, it really is, um, it's a, it's, it's a, it really does highlight the difference between the way the colonists thought about place. And, you know, they just thought, they thought about place like it was just clothing, like, oh, I can just recreate these buildings from another place and just build them here and it'll feel like England. I can just make it look like England. So if I put the clothes on, if I put English clothes on, we can all be English, you know, and so that's, um, you know, that's that's. That's, that's thinking about country as a usurper. You know, I'm just going to put layers and layers and layers on top of it until it becomes England, you know, rather than, you know, and that's got us into all sorts of problems because those buildings obviously aren't sustainable. Um, you know, it was, it was actually about, you know, as Danielle said, you know, just taking the materials from country. So it's not looking after country in any way, shape or form. And I think that that's really the situation that we've found ourselves in now is that we've just got to look beyond it as an aesthetic and actually think about it as, you know, a, a relationship where, you know, we've been born onto the planet in a certain time and place and it's our job to look after it. So the welcome to country, it's not just, oh, welcome, you know, I hope you have a lovely time today. It's it's an invitation to actually care for country, to look after it, and it's a big responsibility. And, and it's interesting, you know, I think we always talk about that relationship because that's a very black fella thing for us. You know, we are, we're always trying to connect. Who's your mob, where you're from, you know, that type of thing. But it's also that relationship, and, and it's interesting, you, you know, talking about how sick country is and the need because you do a lot of that you know cover that in your 
artwork and, and creativity and that relationship base. Can you share something of that, uh, Adam, about, you know, what inspires you and or drives you to actually that type of connection of trying to actually convey in a creative sense in one way, but also a very cultural sense in something that's, you know, shall we call it an urban art movement, so to speak, or is it just, you know, another label that we get put on? Uh, well, wow. you got some humdingers, <laughs> haven't you, today? Well, um, it's, a, it's a great question to direct because, you know, I feel um, somewhat obliged to uh, somewhat typically, uh, <clears throat> I guess, present from the fact that we are all essentially speaking on, be on another's country. And it's really interesting that you pointed about, about the mint. We are literally within the epicenter of corruptive forces on this continent. Mm. So this is where it began. So this is where the first coinage came from uh, this place. And, um, and we all know that that's the root of all evil. Yeah. And so what has transpired to today to um, a consistency in a liberal government's obsession with economics and natural resources um, to the point that has uh, degraded um, our, our First Nations country on this continent. And we're standing right in the epicenter of where it began. And of course, um, within a boomerang throw from where we're sitting is where all of the politics began, um, you know, the resistance movements and whatnot. So um, whilst I'm a Dungadi um, sitting here talking on Gadigal land today, um, my art is, I, I consider myself a bit of a, um, cultural uh, ubiquitarian, if you will. So my commentary, I hope, speaks on behalf of everybody that has the pol political vein in them. And of course, we all wake up with polit politics as blackfellas every day. Yeah. And so um, where possible, I try and acknowledge the local landscape as much as I can and the local cultures. And that's particularly orchestrated through murals and public artworks, important to, um, to, uh, to hone in on the local people. But generally, my practice is speaking about how uh, the umbrella of politics is affecting all of us, even though all of these mobs are living on another, pe another country, um, on Gadigal country. And um, to take it a little further, we also have to acknowledge, and I thought this is probably a cultural context that needs to be addressed pretty early. And um, something I've been talking to the kids a lot about in schools lately, that we look at a map that was devised or conceived in the 90s. So our map of Aboriginal Australia on the wall was conceived in the 90s, which is based on uh, 200 years of hearsay. But what did these countries look like uh, 25,000 years ago? You know, was Wiradjuri country as big as it is today or was it encroached by other mm -hmm. neighbouring countries? So here we are today um, in this, this pulpit of um, political upheaval and, uh, and we try our darndest to acknowledge the country that we're on, but let's face it, unless you know a song line, unless you know a ceremony mm. from yep. wherever you are, it's very difficult to, to do that. So mm. my art is perhaps like a surface scrape of um, the fact that we all like to acknowledge the best we can, but mm. whether it be the, the wind and the rain and, and, the, and the ocean and the flora and fauna. But um, it's, uh, we, we have to, do our, our darndest to try and connect with those who are locally connected culturally as much as possible. Yeah. So it's great seeing we, we actually got some questions starting to come in and I'll just remind um, if, if you do want to have a question, put it in the chat. You know, it's one of those, I, I feel like I'm sort of doing Q and A here now. <laughs> uh, so I better throw in the, you know, also follow us, you know, do those hashtags. Hashtag Sydney is open and hashtag, uh, uh, oh, there's two Sydney is open, on Twitter and, and Instagram. But just going into those questions, and look, there's, I'll, I'll pull in one of those questions there, I think, um, from Sam. How would you suggest non-Indigenous people begin their personal connection with country? And I've, I've, I've got one of those little prompters written there. How, how can you connect with country? And what does it mean from a First Nations perspective as opposed to sort of what governments do and, and what other place management? 
Mm. So that notion, and I'll, I'll just throw it open because we're all, you know, we've all been talking about relationships and the different ways, and there's a, there's a lot here that we're actually saying, and obviously it's very hard, it's very complex, um, and I think the big question is there's a big willingness, and a, a, and as I said, a raising of consciousness of the need for this, but do we actually have the right tools? So, you know, the connecting the country framework that that has been mentioned and that is a great one step, but how do we actually move past that? And I, I, I just put it in the challenge before uh, you know, opening it up. You know, I get a bit surprised when it's great, you know, obviously driven by reconciliation action plans, all the big corporates, wherever you go, whether it's a bank or, or the um, you know, property management, you know, big uh, uh, supermarket chains or you know, the, uh, the shopping centres, and there's these lovely welcome to countries. Mm. But it's also very generic, mm. and it's great that you know, they get an artist in and there's some designs there, but then, and I won't say anything because, oh, no, that's all right, I'm not on ABC Q&A. <laughs> like, things like, you know, Australia Post and Telstra and all of these others, which is great. Mm. But it's, it's, they do the generic and it's across every single branch, yeah. we acknowledge. And I, think, I, th I think there's a big problem with that too, Peter, yeah. in that people think it's just charity and people are just, we're just acknowledging the First Peoples and, like, there is this, this notion that that is still operating over there. So if I just think about, you know, the average family around Coffs Harbour and they might see that and they'll just go, oh, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's to do with Aboriginal people, that's not to do with me. So back to your question about or to, to the question about how can um, how can everyone connect to country? And you know, without without sort of um, you know glossing over you know the importance of, of listening to traditional owners, it just starts it starts with very something very simple, and that is that feeling that you get when you're watching the moon rise over the ocean at night or you know, you're watching the sunrise, you know, on, on top of a mountain. Like everyone has euphoric moments in nature. And, 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 and so really for me it kind of it's tapping into that sort of human connection to nature. But it goes a little bit beyond that, obviously. It goes quite a bit beyond that with our people. In fact, when you start getting into song lines and ecological care for country and all sorts of things, and which is why... You know, and that starts to look into the reasons why we should listen to Aboriginal people. Yeah. Um, but but at the end of the day, you know, I look at all those BCF guys, you know, the boating, camping, fishing people, right? And I just think, well, you know, Aboriginal people have been boating, camping, fishing here for 65,000 years, you know, pretty sustainably, actually. So they might not, you know, so maybe you should think about that when you're driving your four-wheel drive on Boambi Beach, you know, and you're just hooning up there. It's just like... Just yeah. slow down a little bit and actually connect to nature, you know, try and tap into that sort of euphoria that you might feel because that's really the kernel of where that love of country comes from. And if you can just kind of make that grow more and more and more, and it's not just something that you do on Saturday and Sunday, it's something that you take into your job every day too. Because I think it's more, yeah, for me I always say, you know, it just speaks that it's just one more transaction yeah. that's happening. Whereas yeah. what we yeah you know, we've been talking about relationships and yeah. that and it's much deeper, which means it it needs a lot more work and a lot more understanding and and you know some of that we're tapping into some really you know uncomfortable things for a lot of people I, so it takes courage and, and 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 that as well. I'm really struggling. I I realised. If few months ago I was struggling with acknowledging country as a thing and I was like what's going on for me with this and it was that that generic thing where people just say the words and they they have no meaning about it and they say the words and it makes them feel okay about what they're about to do but it's not a, they, what they're about to do is still rape and pillage and so I actually did this big kick up and then I went oh that wasn't okay either 
I think it's. I think we need to be be beyond acknowledging country. It's not. We can't just go say the words anymore. It has to be a commitment to do change yeah. and a commitment commitment to better behaviour and a commitment to not damaging and no no do no harm. Like it has to be more than just saying uh, saying the words. And if you get if I don't want to hear words that don't have any meaning. I actually just I, it, it it offends me to hear words that don't have any meaning. Yeah. And that you don't gen like who are you acknowledging if you don't even like do you even know like you know yeah, so yeah. I so I, I just I had this big thing and I really had to think about it and I've moved on to sort of more 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 than just acknowledging myself it's a, a commitment and I think everyone needs to to make an, that commitment in their in whatever way is important to them to go beyond acknowledging now like come on, we need to move faster. We need to get, get hold of this faster because our Mother Earth is kicking us off actively. Yeah. It's not okay anymore. Yeah. So I'm going to pinpoint more locally and politically as, as per. Um, I've been listening to uh, foreign foreigners deliver welcome to countries and acknowledgement to countries for the last decade. And it seems that within the last decade was the only time that um, a new word was used to refer to what is 4,000 square kilometres named after a Briton named the first Viscount of Sydney. And uh, so we call uh, the 4,000 square kilometres after a, that Briton. And um, today it's spoken by a group of people who aren't from here who acknowledge that all as a four-letter word. Mm. Um, when I moved to Sydney in 2005, um, the Eora Nation was five clans on the coastline. Mm -hmm. Now, having been adopted into the Darug Nation, which is the biggest language group in that 4,000 square kilometres, um, we know that their dominant language is the, the Darug Dalang. So for that, to answer that question, um, if you want to try something culturally fun, you hit the website, uh, daragdalang.com, which is the only Sydney-based Aboriginal website, a language website, which was orchestrated by a, um, a, um, a, a beautiful lawman who's recently left us, unfortunately, for greater pastures. But nonetheless, you can click on the words on all of the phrases and hear him pronounce those language names. So mm. as Alison was saying, what I find is fun is to learn the language name in the Darug language for a kookaburra. Yeah. And next time you're at a campsite and that kookaburra comes down to knock off your sausage, you speak to him by his name and just see if you get a different response. Mm. You see that going on the tree and you call him by his Darug name mm. and you see if you get a different response. And that's just a reminder back to the fundamental questions. How do you connect a country even though we're sitting in a mixed uh, um, concrete jungle here? Mm. Um, there are peregrine falcons f flying above us. The wind that comes channeled through the buildings is a totem. When it rains, most people duck and run for cover and put an umbrella up. And a rain is a totem. And so you're going to just try and engage with the elements, even though you're in the middle of an epicenter, an urban epicenter. And uh, once again, learn some Darug language, and, and, um, which is also um, a, a Gadigal strain as well, as that Parramatta Road, Great Western Highway is the original track that led from Parramatta country all the way down here to where the first fleet landed. Mm -hmm. So it's about embracing that language, and it all starts with language. But I will say, I think it's a, it's a um, commendation to the Australia Post for starting to put that lingo in there because I had that vision years ago. I'm sure many people did. It's, it's not rocket science. You can just, wherever there's a red postcard on your um, Gregory Street directory, I always wondered, hey, it should be called, um, you know, uh, Tuangago country or Wangal country or, and so it's a nice little start, but it's all about language. So get some lingo off the website and go out there and talk to those um, plants and animals. So I think, Things like, you know, what I'm hearing is, of course, yeah, it comes back to that something much more deeper, you know, relationships which are the drivers of it, but it's also that a different way of doing things. And it's the funny thing is we always talk about it, that it's, it's new to a lot of people, but it's, of the, it's in the DNA of this country. It's, it's you know, goes back millennia. Uh, so in and, terms and that's of what, that's what Margot Neal says, Pete, you know, she says, unless you, unless you know the stories and the languages of this land, you'll never truly belong. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody wants to feel a sense of belonging. 
you know, and I think that that's why people quite often they'll grab onto architectural styles from different places because it kind of it's part of their ancestry, you know, so they might, um, but it's but it's like for me I think the more exciting question in terms of, you know, like where where can we go with that in Australia is, you know, where you start to bring, like it's okay to have sort of colonial style buildings, but like where are the Australian stories embedded into those buildings? Like even on Macquarie Street, that um, down at the Asta, which is down on the left-hand side as you go to the um, uh, Opera House there, there's there's a building there and there's koalas as the gargoyles. You know, so over the years there's been sort of very um, superficial sort of attempts from designers and architects to sort of tap into some sort of Australiana or Australian sort of stories, especially with historic buildings, historic houses and things like that. You know, Florence Broadhurst was designing really interesting wallpapers, but she was using Australian native flora and fauna. But it's like, okay, but what what is the point of all of that? Is it just a design aesthetic? Is it just you know, to make things feel more interesting. It's, it, but then when you actually start to look beyond, say, something like the Welcome to Country or, um, you know, let's start encode, let's start understanding. I'm looking at an Aboriginal painting right now, which is why I'm looking over there. But I just think, well, what is behind those symbols and dots? Well, encoded in all of those stories that we're so obsessed about in our dances, our songs, our language, um, uh, our paintings is is vast amounts of ecological and cultural data that will teach us how to care for country. And if we don't, then we're going to have another massive shift in climate that we're not going to survive this time. We did it last time with the with the ice age, but that's because we had a culture that was holistic. You know, it, with it was spiritual, it was ecological, it was scientific, it was all of that wrapped up together. And I think the invitation for for us when we when we when we want people to engage with Aboriginal culture, we want people to engage um, with something like the welcome is to actually, you know, think about how our cities and towns can actually start to encode some of that cultural data so that we understand how to care for it a lot more. So a lot of a lot of the work that's happening and and, and it's you know as you said, Adam, it's great to see this, you know, consciousness and, and willingness to to want to understand more, um, but still the process, you know, so we've got some great policies and ways of doing things, but I think we all can agree we're really still not there because of that awareness, that awakening mm. uh, isn't there of, of, you know, what's what's the step, and I think yeah, the work you've been doing, Danielle, and I'll just use that analogy from Adam, of in this uh, architectural design, these the you know, wanting to embrace the government architects connecting with country and developing, uh, moving forward, embracing and tapping into, you know, First Nations knowledge and ways of being, and not being a cultural transaction, which is is only cultural leasing in one way and 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 blackfellas don't really get the full benefits of so i guess the challenge is and and hopefully a lot of our audience out there of that those first steps of taking your shoes off and walking in country of of moving into the right direction and the right process what would that footstep that be left behind look like to you as in, how, how, what does it look like if it's different? Well, if it's different to those people out there yeah. that are, you know, wanting to design new, new yeah. place management frameworks yeah. or, or that, you know, what's that first footstep yeah. that in, that's, that's going in the right direction yeah. of where so we all can be? It's all got to, it's got to start with country as the first footstep and, and instead of economy or instead of, um, and instead of some, people in an office dreaming something up it has to come from the people who know the place best that dreaming has to come from them what if what if, I mean this is I have these big ideas and, and I don't know if I'll see them in my lifetime but what if we were able to dream up for our own country for our own countries 
um, places that were truly of place, what would it look like? What, what would a vernacular of here look like? And it should look different in every single part, but it should feel of place. And to me, the only way we're ever going to hit that is if we start with country and we start with those who know country best, those who can teach us country and teach us how to connect with it and teach us how to be the best in country. Because otherwise, um, the frameworks for me, they're just a way for, I could, for me to put my foot in the door. Because otherwise people have ignored us for, I don't know how many years you guys have been ignored, but I've been invisible for a long time. And that's just for me to get my foot in the door. And then I'm like pushing the door open and saying, how much do you care? Is it just about you showing to do the right thing? Or do you actually, do you mean it? And I grill the clients now. <laughs> yeah. I grill clients back now and saying, what do you actually mean? What does it actually mean to you to design with country? Why am I here? Because I can go as far as you want me to go and I can push this all the way and talk to all of those people that I've, I'm connected with about how to do this. But I'm not gonna go put waste their time if all you want me to do is do a nice artwork. I can do that too. And don't get me wrong, a nice artwork makes a bloody big difference too. What do you think about that? Does a nice artwork make a big oh, difference I've or is it several formulating yeah. right now <laughs> <laughs> or or but the like i've i've actually you know I've probably had conversations with you about this particularly around these public art commissions mm. and and it goes back to what we were saying before that fundamental and i think this is one of the things what you were just touching on that fundamental question to people and it comes from a relationship base so why why are you actually wanting to do this what are you wanting to achieve? And then in any relationship, it's two way. And how's, how do you think that's gonna impact on Aboriginal people? So in a lot of the public art stuff that I've seen, when I challenge commissioners, um, oh, it's to pay respect and you know, do that. And it's like, yeah, but where are the, where, where are the people in this? How, are, how is this being activated? How, yeah, where is, as you know, it's been mentioned, where is our space that we can actually be? Or is it cultural wallpapering? So, and you're in that space a lot, and it's great, you know, public art and artwork and that gets the foot in the door, but what's the other challenge? What, what's the experiences? What would you want to say to those people out there that are doing the commissions of, this is great as a starting point, but what's the next steps? Right. And I think it all comes down to time, but you know, and respect, it comes yeah. down to uh, mutual respect. But let's start with the great man at the head of the street here, who was responsible for some of those macabre massacres mm -hmm. um, in the early years of the colony. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there were talks when, the, when all of the statues started coming down around the world of the early uh, colonists. There was an interesting debate and I heard um, um, an eminent Aboriginal academic speak on the radio uh, expressing that while he did not agree with pulling down the statues, uh, whereas the knee-jerk reaction amongst community was like, take Cook down, take Macquarie down. Um, and you, you can't deny that history, which has enabled us to be sitting in this air-conditioned room today and uh, be comfortable talking on camera. But um, what we can do is get the, find the balance. So. Uh, old mate up there should be moved to one side of the path, not in the middle of the path, and then on the other side should be uh, either Bungaree or um, or Benelong. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, cut to the chase and 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 stick. Uh, Barangaroo, you mean Barangaroo, don't you? What's that? <laughs> you mean Barangaroo, don't you? You mean a woman? Don't you? <laughs> ah, totally. <laughs> so, um, uh, you're right, exactly. So. Um, Thank you for throwing that in. So what we don't have and what we should have tomorrow is um, uh, the cultural acknowledgement via bronze statues of these key individual figures um, that were pertinent to not only entertaining the colony and, and offering that cultural exchange, like um, old mate who was up there at the observatory. If he didn't write down the lingo, we wouldn't have those Gadigal words today. So where's the acknowledgement for these people? Um, whilst we continue to have these questionable um, white fellow monuments erected around the uh, around the place, it's a step forward that the city of Sydney have created by uh, by implementing the policy of a, a small percent, even, albeit a small percentage of development budgets to 
be allocated to an artwork. And that's where uh, myself and several other First Nations artists in Sydney are starting to get a uh, leg up in terms of having an input into making commentary on the grassroots um, uh, ground zero um, level. But we can go further than that because if you're taking 2% of the development of a new um, uh, sky, sky rise here, it's not that much money, but if we can start spreading that out and just acknowledging those um, people by starting with statues, that's a good way to, to begin. That's what elders the are problem, asking for in the, Sydney. Go on, Elders. Yeah, the problem with public art, Adam, is, you know, like, it's this all comes down to process. So storytelling should be the first thing that's done when you're starting a big development you know, looking at the narrative of the place, thinking about what's gone before, what are the stories of this place, some of those stories, you know, they might relate to, um, you know, the endemic species that have grown there before. It might relate to uh, creation stories, sacred sites that are nearby, um, so locating yourself. See, when blackfellas um, in in, in traditional times in Sydney too, they would have set up a camp and they would have set it all up in terms of its function, its smell, the vegetation, the comfort, which is placemaking, right? Um, but there's this other layer of storytelling and, you know, in today's terms we have to always, we, you know, we're also thinking about like, you know, with what Adam's saying about truth-telling as well, you know, like maybe there were massacres close by so that's part of the, the new story of the place. But, you know, it's, it's that storytelling really has to start at the beginning and quite often with public art policies, you know, it's happening right at the end. So the artists come in there at the very end because of this levy. I, I tell you what, if the levy didn't exist, there wouldn't be that much public art in Australia. So, you know, legislation is very important. Forcing... Um, yeah, which is why this connecting with country framework is extremely important because it's actually forcing the industry's hand to actually change, mm. to change the way that they are delivering um, big developments, which are pretty much, it's just a service industry. It may as well be plumbing, really, because it just, it just lacks the sort of heart and soul. And, you know, now it's being driven by very, very, very powerful real estate forces, which, you know, I mean, they're not really thinking about these wonderful stories. You even look at some of the, you know, a lot of our audience today are really into historic houses. These are places that are steeped in history. They're steeped in story. Um, there is these amazing kind of stories to tell, you know, in Australia. Um, some of them are Indigenous. Some of them are non-Indigenous. Some of them are multicultural. Um, but where these stories intersect is really interesting. And so all we're asking you know, with this connecting with country framework is to kind of bring some of that storytelling into the mix a lot sooner, to think about sustainability and how your building is actually caring for country because these very massive skyscrapers could actually be filtering water, could actually be cleaning the air, could actually be, you know, looking after country, not maybe in the same way as, you know, a beautiful bit of bush does, but you know, bringing really high tech, tech, um, you know, systems in in place, which a lot of green building does these days. You know, that's that's all that that's all that's being asked. It's not, it's not to add on to a whole nother level of difficulty. It's actually saying, well, you've got a sustainability strategy, you've got a public art strategy, you've got with placemaking, we've we've asked you to go and think about the community that's around you. And you got to talk to them. It's just with with connecting with country framework. It's about doing all of that and bringing it all into one sort of story and one sort of narrative. So artists like Adam, artists like Danielle and myself, you know, we need to come into the process on day one because, you know, public art's a classic example. It's just it is wallpaper. It is jewelry that's just tacked onto things at the very end, and by then it's kind of. It's almost just tokenistic when, you know, the build with those historic houses, you know, they tell a story, the fabric of the building, the actual columns, the 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 roof, it all is, it, it was done, they were built in a time when architecture was a form of art. 
it was an art form. And so that we sort of just need the industry to kind of, you know, unlearn a lot of their bad habits and actually just think about a different process. Well, I might go into ABC Q&A mode here now. Um, and there's great, there's great questions here. And I think, you know, just reading through them, we've actually touched on a lot of those answers. So I think, I hope the audience out there is, is actually getting the feel of, of, of what we're uh, actually saying and the needs of, of not only listening, but that deep listening and understanding uh, about that. But I might just shoot through, we've got 10 minutes to go. Um, and shoot through some of these uh, questions so we can give a bit of uh, uh, guidance and, and uh, insight to, to the audience out there. And I think one of the, the most important ones that really jump out to me, and also this, this notion of connecting with country, it's about our past, but it's also about our, our present and future uh, and how they're all interlinked. And on that note, there's a question here for our young First Nations people out there. What advice would you give them if they wish to embark on a career or a creative project in areas that you're working in? Oof, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, so you've got all of our, all futures, of our futures, on top. Uh, cultural futures on, <laughs> on, 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 on online I, here. I, I look, um, I really struggled in institutions and still do. And, and it took me a while to get through to the end of a degree and that sort of thing. Um, but, and you kind of have to do it if you're gonna say you're a designer, unfortunately. So you need to have the right people around you to get through that. But, it, but that isn't the only way you learn. You have to learn from your mob too. And it's equally important. You have to learn from country too, and that's equally important. And so you, you have to have the right, um, support around you to get through that institution because look I, it made me sick to go into it and to do to do university and um and i i won't even i don't even lie about it anymore it was rough as rough as guts to get to the end of my phd i experienced everything i never thought i would experience and and i and it wasn't fair and nobody cared and and um and even though i told them i was what i was experiencing nobody cared so you so universities have to do a lot better to to um, when somebody's saying I'm experiencing racism and bullying, which is what was happening, they actually need to do better and, when, and, and respond. And, um, and so th those young people who are trying to get into these sort of industries, they need to, uh, the support of everyone around them to, to build them up and to get them into those industries in, in a healthy way, which, um, which is, includes, um, I mean, I was bloody lucky. I, I, there was a point where I couldn't, didn't think I could go on and I remember standing on my balcony and going, Look, ancestors, you put me here. I don't know why I'm here. You have to help me. And it, they did, and they sent me help. And so you have to have faith in your culture too. Like not faith in, in a religious way, but belief that your culture can support you and your ancestors are there to support you, even if nobody else is standing next to you. So I don't know, I don't know, does that help? <laughs> mm -hmm. Any yeah, views you want to share? If you, uh, yeah, sure, if you're coming from uh, an artistic perspective, um, I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, read a book called Seven Days in the Art World first, <laughs> um, which will tell you about uh, the, the, um, the be all and end all of, uh, of commercial art on a world scale, but also um, join your uh, closest artist run initiative. And if you don't have one in your immediate area, um, connect with your regional galleries and get involved in the focus groups and uh, um, First Nations groups there learn from those people, and then ultimately come into Sydney and join Bomali Aboriginal artists, and then you can get your big experience in Sydney, and that's the way this fella did it. Mm. Alison? Uh, I th my message to young people is that um, you're, we're on the crest of a wave and you should just get on your surfboard and surf it, man, because we fought for that wave for you <laughs> and we suffered. And we are like, because seriously, like when we started out, I mean, it was like nobody cared <laughs> about what we had to say. But suddenly the spotlight is on Aboriginal Australia now. But I really resonate with something Danielle said, and that is the thing that's going to give you the, the most competency for your job is your culture. So you can't, you can't just parachute a 20-year-old architect 
into some of these connecting with country uh, projects and expect them to be amazing if they haven't got a strong culture. They can be if they've been, like all the mob around here in Gumbangari mob, they're all language speakers, all these young ones. They're all language speakers. They know they put a lot of time and effort into spending time with their elders and getting out on country. And, you know, that is the most important university degree that you can get really these days. But if you have a strong culture, you have the best opportunity ahead of you that blackfellas have had since colonisation, I think. And I think for, you know, the audience out there, you know, the importance of our, our future but to ask yourself the question, if you're, you're in that space, um, you know, what can you do better? What, what can you change and prepare, you know, listening to what we've, we've been saying to help this next generation, to, to allow them to be the, you know, the people who they, they are destined to be, but also to keep them safe and, and, and to, you know, basically what I always say, why is it so hard? It shouldn't be so hard for us. So that simple thing of how do you actually, you know, take it on yourself in that relationship to make things a bit easier as well. So I'll just throw that open, which sort of goes to the next question. And if we can get a quick answers, because we're, we're coming right up to this, the end of our time here. But how do we move past tokenism? Or I'll just throw in a, a, another one is, or not only tokenism, but what are the apathy killers that we need to actually develop? Well, I'm going to say straight up, if you don't mind. Go for it. Demand that the next NRL shirts don't have dots on them. <laughs> yeah. And start with something different. Doesn't matter what it is, but we need to step away from that. Yeah, Aboriginal people, we've got to stop um, stereotyping ourselves. You know, and that's straight off the back of that. And, there, you know, we, we and we'll do that for a while. And even with connecting with country, you know, there'll be some consultants that just say, just slap some Aboriginal art on a building and you've done it. Can and I, can I just jump in there? Is that is that because we're, we're in the space of that relationship that we're only still reacting? Yes. We're reacting yeah. to time frames. Yeah. we're acting. So is the onus on those people who are wanting to actually do that? respect and all of that to actually have the respect to sit down and have a bit of time and talk through those processes and, and absolutely and also we have to think about the systems and themselves like and um we're sort of now at their level probably where we can and especially somebody in government can actually do that and talk about the systems yeah. and talk back to them because the systems aren't enabling it at the moment properly they're enabling it half and, and sometimes not even half like two percent and so the systems need to look at themselves and those who are who are guarding those systems need to let go and if they gen if they're genuine they need to let go if they're not well you know hang on to your systems and we'll just keep seeing the same tokenistic results but can i just add one more thing peter yep. aboriginal culture is one of the most regulated cultures like I've, I've ever come across we've got a lot of rules right and i think a lot of non-Indigenous people just find that in the too hard basket and so they'd rather not even go there or they'll just do something simple and just move on. And I just want to say that when we when we talk about changing the systems, we might sort of say, oh, well, you need to consult with the community. But instead of allowing two days for that, we're just saying, why don't you allow two weeks? So we're not saying it's a big, long piece of string, it's going to be expensive, it's going to be impossible, it's going to be hard and it's just, you, you know, you're going to go on and on forever. So I think that there is just this happy medium and I'd like to say that a lot of the corporates that I've engaged with have been pleasantly surprised at how amazing the whole process has been. They've taken a chance, they've jumped off the cliff with, you know, to do something genuine with Aboriginal people and it's been amazing. Okay, so we're right up to uh, four o'clock. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Alison. Adam, Danielle, it's been a real pleasure and honour to be able to share this time and hopefully our, our, our views and that. And thank you to the audience out there uh, for coming in on a, you know, a lovely uh, Saturday afternoon and not getting out on country and connecting with country. But now you've got a couple of sunlight hours out there to sort of take on, take those shoes off, go out there you know, start to feel and start to just actually think, because I think that's one of the big things, 
you know, we're in this process that we actually don't think. So, you know, I hope you've got a lot of takeaways. There's a couple of other takeaways here and our, our guests here at Sydney Living Museums to give them a bit of a plug. So keep exploring Sydney Open this year. Um, the rest of the month of November, Sydney uh, Living Museums have their website, slm.is uh, slash open. And when you're doing that, all of these wonderful, uh, you know, uh, buildings and that, have that thought, what does this mean to Aboriginal people? But also, particularly if you're here in Sydney, what does it mean to the Gadigal mob here? You know, the resilience of the, you know, what they have endured through. But also, what does it mean? Where is the space for their future and for their aspirations of who they are, where they want to be, where their kids, grandkids, you know, the future generations. So, you know, just leave that with you. You know, there's lots of things to access. You know, hopefully you'll be coming back and unpacking this on the, uh, the you know, when this gets put up on the website, but you'll find podcasts and virtual uh, and audio tours and more panels like this um, on the website. And also that last one, uh, you know, continue learning more about the city and city, uh, the city of Sydney, and I encourage you to attend tomorrow's panel talk, DNA of a, of a city at three to four, which of course we've talked about the resonance of cultural memory and DNA. So hopefully tomorrow you'll hear a little bit more about uh, the First Nations perspective. But once more, I've gone over by one minute. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone here. Um, you know, unfortunately, these are the things that we need to actually sit and just go out and go under the tree and, and uh, have those conversations. So hopefully this will be the catalyst of doing that. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Yeah,